Waylander, Chapter 15 Kodoros watched as Waylander rode from the wagons, heading away to the north towards a range of low hills. The hunter lay flat on his belly, his chin in his hands. Behind him, on the far side of the hill, his horse was tethered. He eased his way back from the hilltop, walked slowly to the steel grey gelding, and unbuckled the thick saddle roll, opening it out on the ground. Within the canvas wrapping was an assortment of weapons ranging from a dismantled crossbow to a set of ivory-handled throwing knives. Godorus assembled the crossbow and selected ten bolts, which he placed in a doeskin quiver at his belt. Then he carefully slid two throwing knives into each of his calf-length riding boots, and two more into sheaths at his side. His sword was strapped to his saddle, along with a Vagrian cavalry bow tipped with gold. The quiver for this hung on his saddle horn. Fully equipped, Kadoris returned the saddle roll to its place and buckled the straps. Then he took some dried meat from his saddlebags and sat back on the grass and stared at the sky, watching the gathering storm clouds drifting in from the east. It was time for the kill. There had been little joy in the hunting. He could have killed Waylander on a dozen occasions, but then it took two to play the game, and Waylander had refused to take part. At first, this had irritated Ghidorus, making him feel slightly as if his victim had held him in contempt. But as the days passed, he had realised that Waylander simply did not care. And so, Ghidorus had not loosed the fatal shaft. He wanted to know why. He was filled with an urge to ride into the wagons and sit opposite Waylander to ask him. Ghidorus had been a hunter for more than a decade, and he knew the role better than any man alive. In the deadliest game of all, he was a master. Understanding every facet, every iron rule, the hunter stalked, the prey evaded or ran, or turned and fought back. But the prey never ignored. Why? Kadoris had expected Waylander to hunt him, had even set elaborate traps around his campsite. Night after night he had hidden in trees, his bow slung, while his blankets lay by warm fires, covering only rocks and branches. Today would end the burning questions. He would kill Waylander and go home. Home. High walls and soulless rooms, and cold-eyed messengers with offers of gold for death, like a tomb with windows. Curse you, Waylander. Why did you make it so easy? It was the only defence, answered Waylander, and Kodora spun round as a sort of shining steel rested on his back. He froze and then relaxed, his right hand inching towards the hidden knives in his boot. Don't be foolish, said Waylander. I can open your throat before you blink. What now, Waylander? I have not yet decided. I should have killed you. Yes, but then life's as full of should haves. Take off your boots, slowly. Kadoris did as he was bid. Now your belt and jerkin. Waylander moved the weapons and hurled them onto the grass. You planned this? asked Kadoris, sitting back and resting on his elbows. Waylander nodded and sheathed his sword, sitting some ten feet from the hunter. You want some dried meat? Kadoris inquired. Waylander shook his head and drew a throwing knife, balancing the blade in his right hand. Before you kill me, may I ask a question? Of course. How did you know I would wait this long? I didn't. I merely hoped. You should know better than any man that the hunter has all the advantages. No man is safe from the assassin, be he king or peasant. But you had something to prove, Kadoris, and that made you an easy prey. I had nothing to prove. Truly? Not even to yourself? Like what? That you were the better man, the greatest hunter? Kadoris leaned back and stared at the sky. Pride, he said. Vanity. It makes fools of us all. We are all fools regardless. Otherwise, we would be farmers watching our sons grow. Kadoris walled to one elbow and grinned. Is that why you've decided to be a hero? Perhaps, admitted Waylander. Does it pay well? I don't know. I haven't been one for very long. You know the Brotherhood will be back. Yes, you can't survive. I know that too. Then why do it? I've seen you with the woman. Why don't you take her to Golgotha and head east to Ventria? You think it would be safe there? Kadora shook his head. You have a point. But then, at least you'd have a chance. On this quest, you have none. I'm touched by your concern. You may not believe it, but it is genuine. I respect you, Waylander, but I feel sorry for you. You are doomed, and by your own hand. Why by mine? Because the skills that are yours are now shackled. I do not know what has happened to you, 
but you are no longer Wayland and the Slayer. If you were, I would now be dead. The Slayer would not have stopped to talk. I cannot argue with that, but then the Kadoras of old would not have waited before loosing an arrow. Maybe we're both getting old. Collect your weapons and ride, said Waylander, sheathing his knife and rising smoothly to his feet. I make no promises, stated Kadoras. Why are you doing this? Just ride. Why not merely give me your knife and offer me your throat, snapped Kadoras. Are you angry because I haven't killed you? Think back to what you were, Waylander. Then you'll know why I'm angry. Kadoras strode to his weapons and retrieved them. Then he pulled on his boots, tightened his saddle cinch, and mounted. Wayland watched as the assassin rode south. Then he wandered back over the hilltop to his own horse and stepped into the saddle. The wagons were lost in the heat haze to the north, but Wayland had no wish to catch up with them before nightfall. He spent the day scouting the wooded hills, sleeping for two hours beside a rock pool shaded by spruce trees. Towards dusk he saw smoke curling into the sky in the north, and a cold dread settled on him. Swiftly he saddled the gelding and raced for the trees, lashing the beast into a furious gallop. For almost a mile he pushed the pace, then sanity returned and he slowed the horse to a canter. His mind was numb, and he knew what he would find before he crested the last hill. The smoke had been too great for a mere campfire, or even ten campfires. Sitting his horse atop the hill he gazed down on the burnt-out wagons. They had been drawn into a rough semicircle as if the drivers had seen the danger with only seconds to spare and had tried to form a fighting circle. Bodies littered the ground and vultures had gathered in a squabbling packs. Waylander rode slowly down the hillside. Many of those now dead had been taken alive and cut to pieces. There had been, then, no prisoners. A child had been nailed to a tree and several women had been staked out with fires built on their chests. A little to the north, Dermist's men lay in a rough circle ringed by dead Nadia warriors. Already the vultures had begun their work, and Waylander could not bear to search for Daniel's body. He turned his horse to the west. The trail was not hard to follow, even under moonlight, and as he rode, Waylander assembled his crossbow. Images flickered in his mind, and Daniel's face appeared. Waylander blinked as tears stung his eyes. He swallowed back the sobs, pushing at his throat, and something in him died. His back straightened as if a weight had been lifted from him, and the recent past floated across his mind's eye like the dreams of another man. He saw the rescue of the priest, the saving of Danielle and the children, the battle at Masson, and the promise made to Orion. He watched in astonishment as Cadorus was free to strike again. Hearing himself talking to Cadorus about heroes, a dry chuckle escaped him. What a fool he must have sounded. Hula had been right. Love was nearly the downfall. But now the Nadir had killed Danielle, and for that they would suffer. No matter that there were hundreds of them. No matter that he could not win. Only one truth was of importance. Waylander the Slayer was back. Danielle knelt beside Dermist on the slopes of a hill overlooking a riverside town of rambling wooden buildings. The hill was thickly wooded and their horses were hidden in a hollow some sixty paces to the south. She was tired. The previous day they had escaped from the Nadir Raiders with seconds to spare and she had felt a sense of shame at their flight. Dermist had been scouting to the west and she had seen him galloping ahead of a Nadir war party, his axe in his hand. Arrows flashed by him as he thundered his bay galley into line with the wagons, hauled on the reins alongside the baker's wagon and shouted for Danielle. Without thinking she had climbed alongside him and he had spurred his mount for the hills. She would be lying to herself if she claimed she had not known he was taking her to safety while those around her were doomed to savage and cruel deaths, and she hated herself for her weakness. Four Nadir riders had pursued them into the hills. Once into the woods, Dermis had dumped her from the saddle and swung his horse to meet their charge. The first had died as Dermis's axe smashed his ribcage. The second had thrust out a lance, which the giant brushed aside before slashing the man's head from his shoulders. The rest of the vicious action had been so swift and chaotic that Danielle could not take it in. Dermist had charged the remaining riders, and the horses had gone down in a welter of flailing hooves. He had risen first, looming like a god of war with his silver axe flashing in the sunlight. With the four men dead, he had looted their saddlebags for food and water, and without a word, bought her in a deer pony. Together, they had headed north into the trees. That night, with the temperature falling, they had slept under a single blanket, and Dermist, still without a word, had removed his clothes and reached for her. Turning into him, she smiled sweetly, 
but his eyes widened as he felt the touch of cold steel at his loins. The knife is very sharp, Dermis. I would suggest you calm yourself and sleep. A simple no would have been sufficient, woman, he said, his blue eyes cold with anger. Then I shall say no. Do you give your word not to touch me? Of course. Since I know your word is as strong as a withered stick, let me tell you this. If you rape me, I shall do my best to kill you. I am not a rapist, woman, nor have I ever been. The name is Danielle. She withdrew the knife and turned her back to him. He sat up and scratched his beard. You do not think highly of me, Danielle. Why? Go to sleep, dearest. Answer me. What a question. You led those people to slaughter and then fled without a backward glance. You are an animal. Your own men stayed behind and died, but you just ran. We just ran, he pointed out. Yes, and don't think I don't hate myself for it. What did you expect me to do, Danielle? Had I stayed, I would have killed maybe six or seven a deer, and then I would have died with the rest. There was no point. You betrayed them all. Yes, but then I was betrayed. I had an arrangement with an Adir chieftain, Butasso. You amaze me. The travellers paid you and had a right to expect loyalty. Instead, you sold them to Nadir. You have to pay a bounty to cross Nadir lands in safety. Tell that to the dead. The dead don't hear so well. She sat up and moved away from him, taking the blanket and wrapping it round her shoulders. They don't touch you, do they? The deaths? Why should they? I lost no friends. All things die, and their time had come. They were people, families. They put their lives in your hands. What are you, my conscience? You have one? Your tongue is as sharp as your dagger. They paid me to guide them. Am I responsible because some Nadir dog-eater breaks his word? Why did you bother to rescue me? Because I wanted to sleep with you. Is that a crime also? No, it's just not a very attractive compliment. God's woman, Waylander is welcome to you. No wonder he's changed. You're like acid on the soul. Now, can we share the blanket? The following day they had travelled in silence until they reached the last line of hills before the river. Halting the horses, Dermis had pointed to the distant blue mountains of the northwest. The tallest peak is Reboas, the sacred giant, and the river runs from that range and continues to the sea a hundred miles north of Purdol. It is called the Rostrius, the river of the dead. What are you planning? There is a town yonder. There I shall book passage on a boat and head for Reboas. What about Waylander? If he's alive, we will see him there. Why not wait in the town for him? He won't come here. He'll strike northwest. We've moved northeast to avoid pursuit. Butasso is a spear, a western tribe. This is Wolf's Head Land. I thought you were travelling only as far as Golgotha. I've changed my mind. Why? Because I am a Drenai. Why should I not want to help Waylander regain the armour of bronze? Because there's no profit in it for you. Let's go, he snapped, spurring his horse forward into the trees. Hiding the horses in a hollow, Demas crept to the crest of the hills overlooking the town. There were some twenty houses and seven warehouses, built alongside a thick wooden jetty. Behind the warehouses was a long, flat building with a shaded porch. That's the inn, said Dermist, but it doubles as the main supply store. There don't seem to be any Nadir riders around. Aren't those people Nadir? asked Dania, pointing to a group of men sitting beside the jetty. No, they are notice. No tribe. Outcasts, originally. Now they farm and ply the river for trade, and the Nadir come to them for iron tools and weapons, blankets and the like. Are you known here? I'm known in most places, Dania. Together they rode into the town where they tied their horses to a hitching rail outside the inn. The inside was dimly lit and smelled of sweat, stale beer and food swimming in grease. Danielle moved to a table by a shuttered window lifting the bar. She pushed the shutters open, wrapping them firmly into the back of a man standing outside. You clumsy cow, he shouted. Danielle turned away from him and sat down, but when he stormed into the inn, still shouting, she stood and drew her sword. The man stopped in his tracks as she advanced on him. He was stocky and dressed in a fur jacket with a thick black belt from which hung two long knives. Go away or I'll kill you, snarled Danielle. Dermist appeared behind the man and grabbing his belt from the back lifted him from his feet and carried him past Danielle. You heard the lady, said Dermist. Go away. Twisting, he hurled the man through the open window, watching in satisfaction as he crashed into the dust several feet beyond the wooden walkway. Then he turned to Danielle with a broad grin on his face. 
I see you are maintaining your reputation for sweetness. I didn't need your help. I'm aware of that. I was doing him a favour. If he was lucky, you would merely have stabbed him, but you might have lost your temper and used your acid tongue, and he would never have recovered from that. That's not very funny. Depends on your standpoint. I've booked us passage on a sailing boat which leaves tomorrow at mid-morning. I have also booked us a room, with two beds, he added pointedly.